Are salty batteries the future of energy storage? Here's my personal experience with installing one, living with one, and some of the reasons you might want to do the same. Also, stay tuned to see if Gary survived waving a length of threaded steel rod around in a storm to hook a cable off the wall that could have been grabbed from waist height. This is a sodium ion battery from Eleven Energy. I've had a few different opportunities to get battery storage installed, but it's getting harder to differentiate them from each other, and none of them really inspired me until this one. It was the right time to pull the trigger on an install because about a year ago I moved into a new house and with it came these solar panels. Top tip, if you're moving into a house with existing solar, get it in writing by the seller's solicitor that they are included as part of the sale. I nearly didn't and it would have meant not being able to transfer the feed-in tariff to my name at the very least and at the very worst it could have caused us big problems if we ever came to sell and move on. Not long after fitting this Shelly monitoring device to my existing solar installation it occurred to me that I was volleying an awful lot of my generated electricity back into the grid and not really benefiting from it so a battery installation was the perfect answer. But which one? This battery system from Eleven Energy won me over. We've all seen the images online of lithium mining and the damage it can wreak to the environment, plus the fact it's extremely rare on the earth and hard to extract and process. All this makes it very costly to both your pocket and the environment. But sodium is different. Sodium is found in the compound sodium chloride, what we usually refer to as salt, and that means it's found in the sea and in old salt mines. In fact, it can even be found as a byproduct of desalination plants. So to say it's not in short supply is to flirt heavily with understatement. Sodium is also less reactive than lithium, making the batteries safer. The technology can cope with more extreme temperature ranges and also allows for deeper cycles of power. So there's a few reasons why I think sodium is the home storage battery tech of the future. Now let's get to the install of this 11 Energy system. A quick bit of background, I've got two arrays on my home, one on the house and one on the detached garage. When it was first installed, the strings from the garage went underground through this ducting and up the conduit to the loft where the old inverter had been doing its job admirably for the last 10 years or so. So the old inverter needed to be removed from the loft and we found a nasty surprise which was this connection in the DC isolator which fell out when our tame installer Adam off of Joju Sailor touched it. This reinforced the decision not to have DC isolators on the new installation. Unprotected strings outside and inducting aren't great so the plan was to replace them with this beautiful bit of PV Ultra from Doncaster Cables. It's unarmoured as it's inducting and the tough sheath provides all the mechanical protection we need in this environment. Plus that way we don't need to get into a debate about earthing the metal framework on the panels. To aid us in getting this PV cable into the loft we got in touch with the good folks at Easy Deck who turned up with one of their Easy Deck access platforms which when Gary and I aren't getting in the way can be put up literally in minutes. This was duly erected and gave us access to the underside of the soffit so we could get the new cable into the loft really easily. They also sent us another Easy Deck access platform which we put up at the other end of the house and then joined them together with a catwalk to create their roofline access system. This allowed the installers access to the solar panels to inspect them in detail during the installation. Then finally we added in this hoist which can be used to get panels from the ground safely onto the platform and turn the system into the solar line access system. We didn't need this part but they were just showing off at this point. So the old inverter's off the wall, we've got our new cable run in and connected to the solar panels up in the loft of the house. Now we're going to head into the garage and start having a look at the install. The physical install is really simple, we're going to start with the inverter and get as many of the connections made into that as possible so the cables are out of the way. Opening the box you can see it comes with loads of fixings and accessories to assist with the install. And they're not messing about either, really sturdy wall anchors are provided. We're not using them on this occasion as we're fixing to a single skin wall and they probably protrude out the other side so we're fixing with good old trusty brown wall plugs and screws. Once the mounting bracket's nice and level the inverter simply slots into place and then we pop in the security screws just in case anyone stands up too quickly and lifts it off the bracket by accident with their head. Then we can start dressing in cables and making connections. First up the DC strings from the garage that were previously installed right past the location of the new install. Once cut to length and checked for the correct polarity it's just a matter of stripping the conductor and crimping on the MC4 connector. This then plugs directly into the bottom of the inverter and you can see here that there's connections for two separate strings. This is really convenient for this installation and also gives rise to some really interesting data opportunities in the exceptional 11 Energy app. More on this later. Then we strip the PV Ultra and again make off the ends and plug them into the other string connection and that's the solar side of things installed and connected. Now you'll notice that we haven't used any DC isolators supplying the inverter. There's a built-in isolator on the underside of the inverter here and we've got the MC4 connectors that we can disconnect if we need to for maintenance purposes. Now we're going to sort out the mains connection. The old installation ran the AC connection from the inverter to the origin down this cable on the outside of the building to this rather hideous old surface mounted meter box and as we have neither the time, the funds nor the inclination to start chopping this into the wall for a recess box we're sticking with it. 
It's actually very handy for standing cups of tea on mid-project. Once the old inverter was removed, we needed to take the old cable off the outside of the house. Having pushed as much through as we could from the hole into the loft, a loop was left hanging on the outside of the building and Gary undertook to remove it, using a long length of steel threaded rod. High in the air. In a storm. Total ledge. Once we'd resuscitated him, we returned to the job. As part of the preparation works, we ran in an EV Ultra cable from Doncaster Cables between the meter box and the new inverter location. We've used EV Ultra for two reasons. One is that we need a connection between the inverter and the origin so that the system can monitor what's being drawn by the property and make a decision to charge the battery off the solar or off the grid, or to discharge the battery so that it gets used by the property or gets exported to the grid. As I'm quite new to actually living with this kind of system, my priority is to understand how we consume energy, manage the way we use it, and maximize the power generated by the panels, exporting as little to the grid as possible in the first instance. The 11 Energy system is completely compatible with Octopus Energy tariffs, so you can actually tell it what tariff you're on and it'll adapt its function to suit, giving you further insights into how you're using energy. This means that if you sign up to, say, the Octopus Flux tariff, you can charge up for three hours at a super cheap rate in the wee small hours of the morning and then sell it back to Octopus at a higher rate in the evening. I'm not sure if this is the right option for me and my installation at the moment, but it's nice to know it's an option. Anyway, Back to practicalities. Technically all we need for this install is a connection between the meter and the inverter, and so we could have got away with the two core data version of this cable, but I would like to go belts and braces with this kind of thing. So for future proofing purposes, we ran in the version with the eight core data cable. It was nothing to do with the fact that I didn't realize that the 11 energy inverter doesn't need a hardwired internet connection and uses Wi-Fi instead. Yeah. So, we just used two of the cores and made them off into an RJ45, which plugs into the bottom of the inverter. As with all the connections on the inverter, thought has been given to maintaining the IP65 rating should you want to install it outside, and so the connector passes through this plastic shroud, which can then be screwed into place, sealing the connections against dust and moisture. We needed to remove the old generation meter and replace it with a new bi-directional meter. This will measure what the system imports as well as exports, and all being well should allow me to retain my FIT payments following this install. We've got a form to fill in explaining what's been done, and then this goes off to my fit provider and Offgen will make the call. Keep your eyes on our socials to see what the outcome of that is. If we didn't have this meter, then in theory I'd be able to charge my battery up with electricity from the grid, and then trick the meter into thinking that my solar array was generating and exporting electricity that in fact I'd just imported. Tempting as it was to commit an act of fraud, my morality simply wouldn't allow it, and also I think they'd realise pretty quickly that it was weird I was generating solar power all through the night. We also needed a bigger board to accommodate a couple of tweaks we'd made to the install elsewhere, so we removed the old Proteus board and replaced it with a new Proteus board. Now the key thing at this end for my battery install is this device. It's a little meter that connects to the inverter via the two cores we made off at the other end, and it also has a connection for a current transformer that clips around the incoming tails and monitors how much power we're importing and exporting at any given moment. This information is then sent to the inverter via the two cores we connected up earlier, and the system can make decisions about what to do with the solar power being generated. You'll notice I've kept the Shelly 3 EM device I mentioned at the outset. I don't need this to monitor my solar generation anymore because the inverter does that for me now. However, I've kept it installed because the inverter is compatible with Shelly devices and they can be integrated into the system and feed back into the information on the app. So at some point this could come in really handy for connecting up to an EV charge point to control the solar charging and make sure it doesn't just dump all the solar into an EV when I don't want it to. I could even use it to monitor individual circuits and loads. Tons of fun. Now back over to the inverter where we're installing the AC isolator and using this plug and socket arrangement on the incoming cable, the conductors are cut to length, stripped and crimped, and then tightened up with an Allen key. Then once the housing is put back into place, we just plug it in and we've got our connection made and the IP65 rating is maintained. And now to the main event, the sodium batteries themselves. Because like all energy storage batteries, they're fairly weighty, we used the heat pump mover to get them off the delivery pallet and into the garage effortlessly without damaging my 43 year old back. This is an upgrade model designed especially for this purpose with this rollered plate that allows you to set the battery down in the exact right position nice and smoothly. The batteries are actually designed with the dimensions required for server racks and to maintain the IP rating of the system 11 Energy provide this storage container with class blocks. This will fit two batteries and it has this angled plate at the back with pre-drilled holes that we can bring the cable through and you don't need to worry about scratching around in the back of the van to find the right size stuffing lands or as I discovered the cool kids are calling them stuffy G's. Hmm because the battery box comes with all the stuffing lands you need ready to go. So once we've screwed the sturdy leveling feet onto the underside of the box, 
and got the stuffing glands in the right places, we can get it into position. Now, unpacking the first battery, you can see that we just need to screw the fixing brackets onto the sides and then slide it home into the battery box. Repeat the same maneuver for battery number two, unpack, screw the fixing brackets on and then slide it home. Once we put the securing screws in place to keep the batteries locked in place, we can start connecting up the cabling. There's a few different bits and bobs to sort out and it can get a little bit bewildering on the first rip, but there's a handy schematic diagram provided that shows you where everything's going to go. It's so simple that our tame apprentice Henry did all the connections. No shade at Henry, he's clearly a beautiful genius. However, it it illustrates that you don't need to be the most experienced installer in the world to get this working properly. It's designed to be simple to install. So first of all, we connected the batteries to each other with a patch lead. Again, all these cables are provided as part of the kit. This connection allows the inverter to talk to both batteries and control the flow of power to and from them. Then we start bringing in the beefy conductors. These are the DC cables that carry the current to and from the battery. They just thread through the stuffy Gs and then they're a simple push fit connection to the battery terminals. So that's the external negative connection made and now we'll do the same with the positive connection. Now, because we've got two batteries for this installation to give us about nine kilowatt hours of storage, we need to connect them together and exactly for that purpose we've got these two linking cables that connect the batteries together and allow for the larger capacity to be filled. Now it's time to make sure the batteries can communicate with the inverter. We do this by means of this pre-terminated data cable that just plugs into the relevant socket on the first battery. There's so much thought gone into the design of this system that there's even a specialised gland on the back with multiple smaller holes that you can pop out to accommodate the thinner cables. Genius. The final bit of physical wiring in the battery box is connecting the box, the batteries and the inverter together with these earthing conductors. Now we make the battery connections to the inverter. Once more there's a really cleverly designed accessory that the single core DC cables pass through and this time screw into the terminals on the underside of the inverter here using the pre-installed ring crimps on the conductors. Once connected and tightened up the shroud pushes up and fixes in place and the final connection to the inverter is the data connection from the batteries and that's just a matter of making off the other end of the data cable into an RJ45 connector, crimping it and plugging it in. It really is quite beautifully simple. After carrying out the relevant tests for the new circuit, it's now time for the big moment, powering up and commissioning. This is something that 11 Energy really pride themselves on, the ease of the commissioning process. On the installer app, you scan for devices and the inverter will connect to your mobile device via Bluetooth. Once it's connected to the inverter, select it to commission. It gives you a handy reminder on the metering connection, ensuring that the CT clamp is pointing the right way. Then tell it how many battery modules you've got connected. In this case, it's two. And then the next screen tells you how to configure the dip switches on the two modules where to connect the incoming data cable into the battery and how to arrange the data link between the modules. Then the next screen will tell you if there's anything wrong with the connections to the meter, grid, battery and photovoltaic array. Once it's run its diagnostic process and it's happy everything's okay, you'll connect the internet via Wi-Fi. Then input some basic information about the installation, name, location and so forth. Then add the details about the grid connection, so the service view size, the export approval, in this case it's the pre-existing G98, which then limits my export power to 3.68 kilowatts. Then we give it some information about the photovoltaic installation, number of strings, what we want to call them, the direction the panels are facing and so on. Once that's done, it processes the information, registers and configures the inverter and connects to the 11 Energy Cloud and that's it, we're up and running. Simple, speedy commissioning. Now it's over to me as a consumer instead of an installer. I receive an email inviting me to onboard to the system. This includes my invitation code and links to the app on the Play Store and whatever the Apple version is called. Opening the app, I can either log in or register an account. I'm new, so I'll register and select the option on the next screen that suggests I have an invitation code. Go through the usual process of creating an account and then add my invitation code. And I'm in. In about a minute, I've got access to the system and I can really get to grips with what this system can do and what it can tell me about my consumption. Now, at the time of recording this, it's the winter in the UK and I've been living with my sodium batteries for about a fortnight. So during that period, we've had all the weather, including a small dusting of snow. So there's been some real fluctuations in how much energy my solar panels have produced, but there's been some days of pure sunshine and the batteries have been through a few charge and discharge cycles. So we've got some data to crunch. I've screen recorded this segment just before midnight, so I've got a full day's data from a pretty sunny day for the time of year. First of all, there's the system page, which is basically home. And at the top, we've got a live readout of where the live power is coming from and how it's being used at this moment. So at this moment, I'm only drawing 200 watts. I'm the only one awake after all. And all of that is coming directly from the grid. 
What's lovely though, is that if I tap this display, it tells me my cumulative energy use for the day and where it went. So you can see that on the left, 8.5 kilowatt hours came from my solar panels, and of that, 3.9 kilowatt hours went into the battery, and the rest fed the load for the day of 12.6 kilowatt hours. Some of the charge from the battery went into feeding the load, and the remaining load was fed by the grid. A mere 4.7 kilowatt hours was drawn from there. On my current energy tariff, that's about £1.20. Pretty good for a freezing cold day in midwinter. Crucially though, you'll notice that none of my solar generation was sent to the grid. Before I installed this system, some of this would definitely have gone that way, but today I used it all. This is achieved by the excess solar energy through the day going into my battery and then being used when the sun's gone down. It's a nice thought that in the pitch black of a winter evening, I'm still running my house on the sunshine from the day. Also on the home screen, you can see the solar summary for the day, the battery charge, obviously it's empty at this time of night, my grid summary of import and export, and the total consumption for my property. Then at the very bottom, we've got alerts and messages about recent battery events, but there's more to be had from this page. Each section can be tapped for some deeper insights. So if I tap the solar section, it takes me to this page where I've got recent comparative data on what the solar's yielded over the past seven days, when my peak energy and power values occurred, and tapping the days in the graph at the top changes the information to that day. It also gives me a handy graph showing what the panels were generating throughout the day. You can see by tapping the graph, it started around 7.30 and stopped generating at about half three. I cannot wait to see what this graph looks like in the summer. There's also this really interesting graph showing the comparative values of how much power the two different arrays were generating through the day. There was very little cloud cover today, so this is an accurate representation showing what a difference shading makes at this time of year, as the garage array clearly gets a bigger burst of sunshine earlier in the day, and then the house takes over before levelling off about even, and then the extra height of the house pays off as the sun moves around the sky. Going back to the system screen, we can do the same with all of these. Diving into the battery, it was the most full at 11.45, at which point I put the dishwasher on, and this drew all the power from the panels, plus a little from the battery for a while. It was pretty stable till the evening at about quarter past five, at which point I put the oven on for dinner, and it dropped off pretty steadily from there. I did, on one day, manage to get the battery to run the house for the whole evening till midnight, but I achieved this by not putting the dishwasher on and getting a Mackey's for dinner. So a bit of a cheat, but still an interesting data point. You can also see on this graph the power going into the battery in the minus figure section and then coming out again at the top. The spikes in either loss of charge or discharge are generally caused by putting the kettle on. Back to the home screen and the grid info. Again, we can see exactly when we're importing power and how much, but also at the bottom, a little voltage monitor showing today the voltage at my house fluctuated between 240 volts and 248 volts, which is a little on the high side. And then there's my total consumption data from all sources, the grid, the battery, and the solar panels, all really neatly indicated in this graph down at the bottom, showing exactly where it was all coming from and when. Now, moving away from the home screen and across to the appliances tab, you can see this is where we can add an energy monitor and controller that could divert excess solar energy into an EV or a water cylinder. Tapping the add an energy monitor button takes us to a menu where we can add a Shelly or Tasmota device. We're not quite there on this install, but if in the summer I'm tearing my hair out because all my energy is being fed back into the grid, I may have to start boxing a bit more clever. Then we've got the stats tab. This is where you'll find all your historic data grouped by week initially. You can look at previous week's information. Again, there's similar groupings as the system page, generation, total consumption, grid imports and exports, and battery charge levels. You can also group the data by month, year, or all time. Looking at the last tab, simply titled More, you can find the settings and control information. Local connection can be used to connect to your inverter via Bluetooth if you need to. Site and system settings takes you to a page where you can see and adjust some of the settings that were made during the commissioning process. Under diagnostics, you can get seriously detailed information on the system and how each individual component is functioning. This is really helpful for communicating with the installing engineer should you have any concerns about the well-being of the system. You can even add users should your spouse or offspring decide to take an interest in the energy management possibilities of the home battery system. They probably won't know. You can also add your energy provider and tell the system what tariff you're on. This is really helpful for the next part of the app, the work mode and timers. Let's run through the hybrid work modes and how your inverter decides what to do with your solar and battery energy. Self-consumption is the everyday mode. Solar powers your home first, spare energy charges the battery, and once that's full, any extra goes to the grid. If you need more power than the sun and battery can provide, the grid just fills the gap. Smart schedules allows you to take control, set times to charge the battery or export energy, perfect for cheap overnight tariffs or high export rates. Outside those times, it switches back to self-consumption automatically. 
Backup supply keeps you covered in a power cut. The battery stays topped up from the grid so it's always ready. If the grid drops, your EPS runs from the battery until power returns. And local charging gives you simple timed charging and discharging stored right on the inverter, so it keeps you working even without an internet connection. So working backwards through the video, as a consumer, I love this product. The app is simple, intuitive, and provides me with tons of information that allows me to manage my energy without it being daunting or overwhelming to take control. As an installer, I was blown away by how quick and easy it was to get up and running and by all the thoughtful little details that make the process as smooth as possible, both from an installation and a commissioning point of view. And finally, as an inhabitant of planet Earth, I love that sodium is a bountiful material that causes minimal environmental impact to extract and process and allows me to play a small part in easing the strain on our generation and distribution systems. I think we can all agree that while most batteries go up to 10, this one goes all the way to 11. Click the link in the description for more information and thank you very much for watching. So here we have Gary Hayes out in a thunderstorm <laughs> with a long metal rod dragging a cable yeah. off the side of the building. <laughs> I ask you, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs>